Tracy. We are so happy to have you on. Hi, Tracy. Oh, hi. Thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to it. It's quite yeah. nice doing stuff for young women. I like doing stuff for young women. You know what? I actually saw you on TikTok and then I found your Instagram and then I messaged you because I loved what you were talking about. It just, I feel like people don't have these open conversations about sex and you've written like over a dozen books, right? Like 17, 18 yeah. books. <clears throat> 17 books oh over a long gosh. period of time though. Yeah, I know that is long, but you've got to bear in mind, this is in the days when sex before, I mean, before the internet came along, sex books were all people had to find information. And I was writing two a year, as well as doing TV shows, radio shows, God knows what else. And then all of a sudden the internet came along, it was like, no more sex books. <laughs> it was quite <laughs> interesting. So, and then it came back again because people did still need them, but um, but not as much as, as you kind of did back then. So you are in, when you talk about there's not that much information out there for women and sex, you're in the right generation because you think it's bad now, you should have seen it back then. Like at right. least now, there are tons of podcasts, there are tons of places that you can get really good information from actually. Yeah, I, I'm curious because, you know, sex has been a, it's always been a taboo thing to talk about. Were you always comfortable talking about sex? Like what inspired you to start writing these sex dating relationship books? Um, I think it was, I had a big sister who's four years older than me and she works for family planning or worked for family planning, which deals a lot with contraception and STIs and all that sort of stuff. So she would be coming home to me and sort of like giving me pamphlets about sex. And, and, and I don't know whether it was a bit of that where I got really used to reading things like how to tell if you have herpes or how to put on a condom <laughs> or all this sort of stuff. And then my mum and my dad split up when I was 15 and I remember just thinking, wow, these forces of sex and love are incredibly powerful. Mm. And so then when I went to university, I was a little bit um, stuffed up by it all and got attracted to psychology and sex therapy because of it, which everybody who does psychology has always got a drama in their past or a trauma in their past. Mm -hmm. And then, but I've always loved writing. So then I didn't know whether to, I did journalism as well as um, psychology. And I wanted to, be, wanted to be a writer, but then I wasn't sure whether or not I wanted to be a sex therapist. And I'm so glad that I didn't become a sex therapist because I think it's really difficult for sex therapists because they, they sort of deal with the same stuff all the time. It's always yeah. like, oh, uh, and I don't know whether I would have been very good doing that. Plus, I'm not very good at um, disassociating from people. So I'd end up looking after people forever and ever and ever. So that, <laughs> I think, I did it. So that's kind of how I got into it as well as answering, was I always comfortable talking about sex? But yeah, I was, my family were really open talking about sex. I don't know why there was nothing particularly special about our family, but <laughs> we, never, we weren't religious. We weren't. And I think when your parents divorce, you're forced into having a grown up relationship with them quite early. Mm, because yeah. then you have to see them as these flawed human beings who've actually had sex with somebody they shouldn't have and you you can't pretend anymore that they're your mum and dad you don't have sex if you know what I mean <laughs> right right well so also yeah well you were saying how um you know now information is so much more widely available and you actually just started your podcast called sex talk mm. and with, even with all the information on the internet and in books, did you feel like it was important to make it even more widely available? Um, yes, I did. And because uh, podcasts are definitely the way to go, number one. Yeah. Um, and number two, I think particularly for, not so much for your generation, but for, and I'm surprised that TikTok picked up on it, to be frank. I was like, wow, and these are all young people looking at this. So I originally thought this is gonna be great for middle-aged women who probably you know, haven't had that much exposure to somebody like me who tends to talk quite bluntly about sex. <laughs> but I was amazed that on TikTok, it was like, what's it doing on TikTok? Why is it getting so many hits? And especially the thing that, horrified me actually was when it was the one about that only 20 percent of women orgasm during penetrative sex during intercourse and yes honestly, I think I that's think, the one that I saw I think that was the yeah. TikTok of yours I saw that's the one that got the most tits and, and I was really like really do people not know this how can they not know this 
I was astounded that most women didn't know it. So please tell me you guys knew that before then, right? I I, I, I actually kind of figured that out on my own. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess we didn't know like the percentage was so low. Yeah. It makes yeah. sense, but it's just like, I guess we didn't really know like it's that low. It is that low. And people don't know things like that because I think that they, I think women lie to other women as well. Like if mm -hmm. if you if you mm -hmm. sort of say, well, oh, I have no problems. And then you're like, oh yeah, I don't either. I mean, not now, obviously at my age, but um, back in you, when you're in your people pleasy early teens, you know, early twenties, late teens, early twenties, I think we all want to be part of a group and we don't want to be seen as anything different. So yes. I think it's very easy for women to lie to each other about stuff like that. We need yes. to stop that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm curious if you um, also think that men and women have been lied to by the media mm -hmm. about, um, you know, what's supposed to feel good, what doesn't feel good, things like that. I feel like that's also a really important factor in all of this. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. I'm always shouting at the television. My poor partner. <laughs> My husband's going, I'll just shut up. Because I honestly, they have middle-aged couples who've been together for about 25 years who suddenly wake up and have all this hot sex against a wall. And it's like, it's not like that long-term. That's just not what happens. It is not what happens. No one ever does foreplay. They penetrate within about two seconds flat, don't they? And it's like, this is not real sex. But we are being fed this all the time. If we're not being fed that, we're being fed porn. This mm -hmm. is not a realistic, inter you know, it's, it's a little bit better in some shows. I'm trying to think now. Girls was pretty good, I thought. Okay, With yeah. Uh -huh. normal, normal People, did you watch that one? By um, I didn't, I didn't see that one, but I yeah. know it was really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that portrayed sex as sex really is, but there are very, very few um, places that show sex as it really is. So yes, we're lied to all the time. We're told that hot desire lasts forever, no matter how long you're with somebody, mm -hmm. and it doesn't. You have to really work at that, and you just have to accept that it changes. We're told that women are ready for sex within two seconds flat, um, that they don't need foreplay. We're told that it, it still perpetuates the myth that intercourse is the you know the whole thing that we're all working up to I mean the amount of times that people say to me um does it count is it count as a sex session if you don't have intercourse well of course it counts <laughs> sex is sex sex is a passionate kiss sex is you know foreplay is sex we need to move away from this yes. thing that foreplay is something you do before sex sex that is sex yeah so yes we lie to you by the media about all sorts of things and I'm curious what your thoughts are about how with the age of the internet if porn has like influence especially like young men as I to what they is. think it is or how they think they're supposed to do it absolutely i mean young men are using porn as sex education mm -hmm. and porn is sex inspiration not education mm. it, and they and this is where all these awful things like choking and threesomes and you know not what the threesomes is awful but expecting that this is the norm is is not right they look at that and they think okay because they these kids have been brought up on it since they were 10 so they, and no one talks to them about porn. Their parents don't go, hey, you know what? You're 10 or 12, you're going to be looking at porn and this is not real and this is not how real sex is. So just so you know, that would be helpful, mum and dad. That would be really helpful. Yeah. And, but they don't. So they brought up watching whatever categories they watch where they see women worshipping the penis, you know, having sex with loads of men, you know, wanting to be choked, wanting to all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And then they go out with women who then you know then they you know go out with young women who then feel all they've been watching porn too and falling for the same thing yes. and thinking that you know this is what I should have to do to please a man I mean yes I, I've had this theory for a while that it's like this cell it's like the snowball effect it's like men learn especially with like the um you know women orgasming not through penetrative sex mm -hmm. women have learned to you know vocalize to certain things from porn from the media and that's negatively reinforced men who are like well this always works for the girls that I, you know that i've been with and it's like well they, right and then it's like well they've been doing something for you and like no one's really benefiting here and you have to like break the cycle somewhere because everyone's you know one person's performing and the other person's getting misinformation Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I've gotten that that argument a lot. Well, this works for everybody else. And it's like, oh. 
God. It's just, it's just ridiculous. It, whenever men say that, I always, I actually want to laugh out loud into their faces because it's like, oh, uh, do you not think that maybe she was lying? Don't I? And they say, oh, I could tell. I can really tell when a woman's had an orgasm. <laughs> well, you cannot tell. There is no <laughs> sign that would ever tell you whether she's had an orgasm for sure. Only she knows whether she's had an orgasm. And men are used to women faking. And women fake all the time. And women are going to have to break this cycle because it sure as hell isn't going to be men. We have to stop lying and educate our very first boyfriends to say, right, this is how it works. We can only have an orgasm through clitoral stimulation. Now you can do this by doing this, this, and this. You know, and, and we need to understand our bodies and recognize that, in fact, the clitoris just isn't that tip that we see, but it's massive. It goes like in two legs. It runs the body of the clitoris is about two centimeters long. It runs in legs down the side. So there are lots of ways to stimulate the clitoris without just stimulating the little tip of it. So that's all about moving yourself around during um, penetrative sex so that you, you know, can actually um stimulate the inner clitoris as well so we need to be more educated about our bodies and we need to be telling men young men so very early on they understand yeah so yeah. how do you suggest going about that being better commu a better communicator with your partner without making them feel self-conscious or like oh my god have i been doing it wrong the whole time and i'm now i'm you know nervous or whatever I think it's really difficult because at the very beginning, when everybody's trying to please, no one wants to come out and go, hey, you know what? Oh, your girlfriends have been lying. And I'm going to be the only one at the very beginning because you want them to like you. So we, mm -hmm. we and that's exactly when you fake it most is at the beginning because you want them to like you. You don't really, really feel like having a big discussion. But so I think kind of maybe if you're with somebody I mean, if it was casual sex, I'd just say straight out, this is what I need to orgasm because who cares in casual sex is all very selfish, right? But in relationships, I would maybe wait a month into your sexual relationship. And that's when I would be starting to say things like, hey, you know, have you been reading all this stuff or did you listen? Just make up something. Say, I was watching a thing on TikTok about <laughs> women not orgasming. That's how you bring it into conversation. Then he'll say, oh, but you do. Or, and then you can just, just, Tell them the white line and say, yeah, most of the time I do, but you know what? Most, you know, or some of the time I do, but do you know what? Some of the time I do, it would be helpful if you did this and this and this. And then you sort of break them into it slowly until they they sort of understand. And, and also don't just make it about you. Say things like, um, and what do you like? Because there's really loads of myths about men as well. Yeah. You know? yeah. I mean, so, I mean, who'd be a man? I have the opposite to penis envy because with us, everything's hidden for them when they first have sex with somebody they've got to hope like hell that you like the look of his penis the size of his penis that it's going yeah. to work well that it's, he's going to get an erection that he's going to keep the erection that he's going to orgasm at the right time you know it's a lot of stress on men as well so they're panicking as much as we're thinking you're getting it all wrong they're trying to live up to their ideal of what the movies are telling them and tv's telling them yeah they're of them it's yeah right, really. I never, I've never thought about it the other way and that's Me neither that's all the all the pressure that men are going through as well and all of these expectations that they're trying to live up to in their own head and it's so interesting how there's completely different dialogues going on in our brains yeah. at, it's just very interesting um I'm curious how you think because I feel like getting to the point of being able to communicate with your partner like that comes at a certain age I'm curious how you think like sex evolves over time, like from our teenagehood to your 20s, your 30s, and then even, you know, way, you know, beyond that, like how sex, I, it normally, it gets better with age, right? Is that? Fingers crossed. Is, <laughs> that's what I've heard. Yeah. Or, is, or I haven't you? been lied to from the media. No, you haven't been lied to. How, how old are you two? We're both 27. 27. Oh, yeah. Gosh, you both are very young for 27. Um, I think that, yeah, I think when you when you first start out in sex, it's all about just isn't it, experimenting, learning. Mm -hmm. I think women, particularly in their late teens, early twenties, I watch my stepdaughter. She's twenty, and to me, it seems like it's a lot about testing your sexual power. Mm -hmm. It's a lot about that. I think it's quite people pleasing sex in your twenties. I think women are quite 
concern with wanting to be liked and I think there's a lot of oh yeah no that's great honey and yeah no you're fantastic and that very female thing but at your age 27 I think interesting things happen 27 until about 35 because I think you get more confident you know your body better you have mm -hmm. discussions like this you're like going well hey this is you know this isn't just me it's actually everybody and and you you probably then form quite adult relationships with a bit better communication because you you know you're probably thinking about settling down maybe or you just tend to have more settled adult relationships at that age which means generally better communication talking about sex um and of course, it all depends on your motivation, though, because if you're a 27 year old who has a high sex drive and really enjoys sex and wants it to be good, then you probably are going to start, you know, seeking out men who understand women's bodies or making sure they do and talking to them about it. But if you haven't got a very high libido, you're probably not going to bother, which is sort of, again, one of those snowballing things, because if you don't have a high libido, you put no effort into sex. If you're a female that doesn't try and make sex better, you have to do it yourself, right? You have to know your body. You have to masturbate to know how to orgasm. You have to teach your partner. It's not easy. You probably don't put as much effort into it, which means you're set up for a lifetime of bad sex, which means you're going to hate it even more. So it's very interesting the way life goes with all that. So I think, I think, yeah, for females, you have start to have good sex, 27 to 35. And then, of course, if you have kids, then, hello, buy sex drive. Oh, but, gosh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so you've got all that to contend with young children because nothing kills a sex drive more than young children because you're <laughs> knackered. You're absolutely exhausted. Yes. You know, and then as much as they want to help, you know, can't help as much. So you go through that period. Then you come out of that period where the kids grow up a bit and you probably rediscover it a bit. And then you get to, um, like, I've just written a book called um, Great Sex Starts at 50. You get to 50 and then you've got menopause to deal with. But then what happens at 50 also is that you get lots of women who stayed maybe in bad relationships or boring marriages and go, you know what, I've done it now, I've done everything for them, I've done the kids this is going to be me, ditch the boring husband, run off and usually have sex with some nice young guy who they've <laughs> and end up having great sex and because they understand their bodies. So it is a real roller coaster, but it's very much in your control. You know, your sex life is determined by you. If you make the effort to understand your body, if you make the effort to make sure that your partners are educated, choose the right partners who are open to being educated, then you will have great sex. If you want to just leave it up to the bloke for the rest of your life, you're going to have awful sex. <laughs> oh my gosh. It really, it really is our, yeah, like you were saying in the beginning, it's the women's, it's our decision to, to make our sex lives better and also just break this cycle that men yes. and women have been stuck in. Yeah. And it and is so largely based in like lack of communication. It yeah. is. And it's a myth, like this myth that women have a lower sex drive than men. That's absolutely not true at all. Women are, get bored very quickly, much more quickly than men. Like if you said to a guy who was 20, right, you're going to have the same sex every single, like five days a week, but exactly the same sex for the rest of your life. You go, you know, what? that's fine. If you said that to a woman, she'd go, are you crazy? I'm really <laughs> bored. Women need novelty and excitement and adventure and eroticism. We're the ones that live in our heads and want yeah. fantasy. And, you know, uh, so women don't have a lower libido. We're bored. Give a woman wow. great interesting sex and suddenly she'll be interested. It's just that men, could because they orgasm so easily, they don't yeah. care. That's a good point. Wow. I've never I, thought I, of it I'm like curious. That. So since women get, you know, bored more easily than men do, what are some healthy sex practices for like long term relationships? Like how do you, um, you know, keep things interesting or just keep you know the communication going? I think number one, you need to set up a regular masturbatory session. So masturbate regularly. Best thing you can do as a female keeps everything in good nick keeps you, you you in touch with how you orgasm, all that sort of stuff. But also don't just try and do it with a vibrator, even though everybody does, because it's easy, but make sure you know a partner friendly method that you can teach your partner. If like some women 
find it impossible to orgasm through um, without using a vibrator. So mm -hmm. if that's the case, then you just introduce the vibrator to your partner. Hey, this is how I need to be. You know, this is how I, I orgasm. So can we make sure we use it in bed with with um with each other? Now, if you're going to do that, by the way, don't choose your rabbit. Choose a nice slimline vibrator that's not threatening because men are terrified about size. Anything you bring out, they're going to go. Oh, so you can't bring, bring that big. <laughs> So they will, they feel so threatened by everything. I couldn't just tell you, they are so threatened by size and hardness of erection and all that sort of stuff. But I think a regular masturbation habit is very good. It keeps you in touch with your body and it keeps your libido nice and topped up. Um, the other thing is communication, yes, but I would say also manage your expectations. Don't get fooled by the media. Don't be thinking, well, hang on, you know, why, why am I not, you know, being thrown across the bed when we've been together 10 years, you know, because no one throws people across the bed up. <laughs> you do if you plan sex or make a point and go, okay, right, how about we come up with something new once a month, just taking turns, you know, long term, or come up with something new once a week, or, you know, like get, put as much effort into your sex life as you do the rest of your mm. relationship. And I mean, we don't go, we don't eat the same meal every night. We don't go to the same restaurant every single time, but we have sex, most couples in exactly the same way, exactly the same way, exactly the same time period spent on each thing and we and then we go I don't know why I'm bored well <laughs> you'd be bored if you ate spaghetti bolognese every night and you only went to Italian but then we think that it's somehow magically meant to sort itself out and it doesn't it's not magic it's not it's not natural it's not you know it's it is natural but you have to put effort into it yeah yeah I didn't even think about like the time because you feel like it's you know always at the end of the night when you're exhausted but just kind of finding different times even just that was like changing yeah, things up a little bit last thing of day. and also we get it all wrong like I I don't want to come for a big dinner out big romantic dinner out and have sex at the end of the night I'm knackered my stomach's too full. <laughs> yuck how yeah. about before you go out right? actually Do I read an article you. saying um uh saying too full to fuck <laughs> Which is... yeah, exactly seriously so you know all that stuff have sex before you go out like if you want to get dressed up have a glass of wine and then go off and have sex and then go out and have dinner everybody's happy yeah don't leave it to the last thing do not leave it a lot of sex problems and and especially differing sexual drives can be fixed if you do it a different time of day because it's generally somebody wants it um, like so if somebody wants more sex more. It tends to be that they want they've got a higher motivation and they want it late at night and they're more highly motivated. Even if they're tired, they'll still do it. But if you have got low motivation for sex and you're tired at the end of the day, you're not going to want to do it. So just do it in the morning, do it in the afternoon, on the weekends, do it whenever you can. That suits both of you. Yeah, you had touched on. Um, you said you know have a glass of wine, go out, whatever. And this is actually a, a listener question, but there's there's just no denying that you have a couple drinks and you're you're more comfortable and you're more confident. But what happens if you can only enjoy sex after being, drunk. being intoxicated? Yeah, or high or whatever. Very common, very common in all age groups, can I tell you? Um, mm. But your age group, because I think you're so used to having sex when you're drunk, because that's how most people have first time sex with a partner is when they're drunk. Um, the problem with having sex when you're drunk is that, I mean, one or two drinks, fine, great. You know, releases inhibitions. There's studies that show that after women have had one or two drinks that they have higher testosterone in their um, blood. So for some reason, alcohol stimulates testosterone, which we know is linked to sex drive. So there is ah. something in it. It's not just that it relaxes inhibitions and makes you happy and giggly and puts you more in the mood and you lose your inhibitions a bit. So one or two drinks, fine. Most couples in the world do that if they drink, right? But once you get into three or four or more, everything goes wrong. He has trouble with erections. You have trouble with orgasms, which are not that easy at the best of time, because it's not just your brain that goes comfortably numb or your um, your sensitivity or nerve endings go numb. So it's much harder to orgasm with too much alcohol than it is with no alcohol. And the orgasm is much more intense without alcohol. Um, so if you, it's like if you have sex, I hate morning sex, but if you have sex in the morning, <laughs> it's so much more intense. You're like, wow, I've forgotten how intense this feels because I always have sex after a few wines usually. So mm -hmm. you do, and also the thing with drunk sex and, and sober sex is 
junk sex, you're likely to do more risque things, mm-hmm. like oh, let's go out and have semi-public sex or something. But sober sex or soberish sex, you're more likely to make more of an effort with each other you're more, more likely to try a new position to try a new technique go into another room goes you know what I mean like because it's energy when you the more you drink yeah. the less energy, you just take the easy lazy way and it also doesn't send a great message to your partner if you have to be drunk because it basically says look you know I don't either fancy you that much because I have to get drunk to have you know that's the message it gives or I don't actually like having sex with you that much that's why I have to drink to get through it because mm-hmm. some people yeah. don't just drink to get in the mood. They drink because they actually hate what they're doing. Whoa. Wow. Yeah, yeah. that's, I didn't even think about that. That's, mm. that's, um, okay, sorry. We have, we have another listener question that I want to make sure we, we ask you. It's kind of just off topic, but um, uh, we had a listener ask, is it normal to not get wet during sex? Yes. And this is something that absolutely made me, go livid was I have always just I suppose because I'm, I'm not your average person because I've been talking about sex since I was so young but I've had people say or women say to me oh I don't use lube because my partner gets upset or thinks it's cheating or it's like what the yes. hell is that and yeah it is oh wow it's like listen our lubrication system isn't just based on arousal First up, most most if most men were better at sex and gave us more foreplay, then we would lubricate probably a lot more easily. But it's not just affected by that. It's affected by medication. It's affected by time of the month. It's affected by how much water you've drunk, how much alcohol you've drunk. So many different factors. You could be as turned on as hell and still not lubricate. It's like him with an erection. He could be as turned on as hell and not get an erection because if he's tired, if he's stressed, if he's you know drunk too much. It's not a... People use it as a measure of, are they into me? Uh, is she aroused? She's wet. Mm. Is he aroused? He has an erection. Not true. And some mm. people just don't lubricate that much. So it's no, it's not true. It's, so it doesn't, and lots of women struggle with this. And women struggle with painful sex because of this, because they feel like, God, you know, I'm not lubricating, but they feel embarrassed using lube or like their partners judge them for it. Then they go ahead having sex when they're not lubricated. It hurts. Then your body goes, this isn't very good. I know what's, you know, if this penis is coming near me, I'm just going to tense up. And then it's a, another snowballing awful situation. So mm-hmm. if you're not lubricating properly, I mean, if you're worried about being judged, just, just put some lube high into the vagina before you start having sex with your partner and it will naturally work its way down. Mm-hmm. Right? And, that's a, you know, that's so a good... If you, yeah, if you're worried about it. Personally, I don't think any woman should have sex without using extra lube. I think you should always have good quality lube beside you and be using it all the time because of the reason I just said, because, you know, lubrication doesn't happen as, you know, automatically as you think it should. So, and, you know, just, just happens. Some days it's there and some days it's not. Yeah. It's like totally varies on so many different factors, yeah. not just right. arousal. Well, also, you what I- no, sorry. Oh, I was going to say what I was thinking when you were talking about the reverse and how like a, a man could be super aroused and not get an erection. And it's like, if you were in the position of being in a relationship and your boyfriend's like, well, what the heck is that about? Like, you know, are you not turned on? You could, you could communicate that to him and say, well, sometimes you're turned on, but you know what I mean? That might open up the conversation. Yeah. And I'm probably, I'm just thinking that I'm probably going to, coming across a bit man bashing here, but I'm not, I'm not man bashing. I'm just, women are so much more complicated sexually than men, but, but we're not. If, if, if they understood, took some time to find out how our bodies work, which is very different to how their bodies work, it would all be easy. And I guess I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed that mm. all these years, men still haven't come to the party. They still don't <laughs> seem to figure it out. And it's like, Jesus, I've been talking about this since I was 25. I'm now 60, for God's sake. Like, who is, where are they? You know, why don't they figure this out? Well, well you're, you are doing, you are really doing the work, Tracy. I mean, you are, yeah. this, even this conversation, I feel like is going to be so powerful for so many women and just being able to break that cycle and even men like my boyfriend listens to this podcast he's gonna love hearing this episode and just like not feeling bashed but just being like oh wow like 
you know, yeah. I learned something today or whatever. And so um, you really are, even though you're frustrated, you really are doing the work and you're, you're helping so many people. Um, I have a question for you about what a sex positive house household looks like. I mean, you said you grew up in a house where, you know, your parents talked about sex, but how mm -hmm. do we, for our listeners who have, you know, young children at home or teenagers at home, how do we effectively talk about sex with children without, you know, scarring them or introducing them to something that they're not ready to you understand? You will not scar a child by talking about sex. Let me oh, tell you, you will not. Um, there is a brilliant book, by the way, that's just been um, come out for anyone who has a kid should read it called No Shame. And it's by the shameless psychiatrist. It's really, really good. Um, yeah, it's called No Shame. But anyway, but what you need to do, if you've got a child or you've got a teenager, Everyone has in their head that you've got to have this big talk, that you've mm. got to sit on, oh, honey, I need to talk to you about this. Well, no kid's going to want to talk about that. You just talk, you start having little tiny conversations. So, for instance, when you're, you know, when your kids are small, don't say, you know, you, you don't call them a wee wee, you call it a vagina, you call it a clitoris, you call it, a, you know, when they're four or five, but I mean, even pre then, really. I mean, my sister, because she's um, worked at family planning, she always called everything correctly and she answered all of her kids' questions. And I remember my, um, my niece and nephew, Maddie and Charlie, being staying over there once because I lived in Sydney and used to come up to Brisbane. And I <laughs> being there and, and I heard Charlie say to Maddie, and you know, they were tiny, they must, must have been five or six. He said, what's a virgin again? She said, someone who hasn't had penetrative sex. <laughs> oh my God, have you done your job, my sister? Brilliant. So it's, and she did that through little conversations. So, mm -hmm. and again, you say things like, oh, I read this, you know, to your teenage girl that you've never spoken to about sex before you say, God, I was reading this about that most teenage girls, you know, don't realize that, you know, most men want more than just sex, that men are as interested in love as well. And, you know, I pick a love sex topic and bring it in that way. Just just start bringing up sex the same way you would every other topic. Mm. You, know, you don't sit there and go, I'm going to teach you about food now and talk to them for an hour. <laughs> you you, you right. teach them about food as you're going along. So it's when you see something interesting in, I mean, I did this with my stepdaughter. It was like, God, I read today that, you know, no one's using condoms anymore. Do people use condoms in your class? Do people use condoms in your generation? And she eventually was like, I don't want to talk about that. And now she talks about it easily. So it's just having little bite-sized conversations about sex is the best thing you can do for everybody in that household, mum and dad included. So, but honestly, please don't think that the schools are going to do your job for you mm. as a parent because they are not, it's abysmal. Please yeah, no. don't leave your kid to find out about sex through porn because they're just going to learn the most awful lessons about sex. And friends try and help as much as they can, but they only have limited information as well. Watch Sex Education. Get your kids watching that. You know that show? I love, oh, I love yeah. that show. I know. Fantastic. It's such a good show. It's, it's coming back for a third it? season and I can't wait. I know. I can't wait too. But we all need a little Otis running around that we can go and ask. This is the guy who's, well, Gillian Anderson, her son, is yeah. a sex, um, is he's she's a sex um, therapist, and he's he sort of is a, her little protege, isn't he? Really, he's running around with money for it. But um, but yeah, so so or you know, just yeah, just talk about it, communicate about it. Don't use the correct terms and educate. If you have daughters, please talk to them. Explain that all orgasms originate through the clitoris. If she is one of the lucky 20% who can, you know, climax through penetrative sex is because anatomically, probably her clitoris is a little bit closer to the opening mm -hmm. of the vagina and it gets pulled during, so inadvertently stimulated. Um, so all of these things, I mean, if you knew that when you were young, it makes life so much easier, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, what I'm thinking about too is even for parents, like, you know, some people our age are parents and we're still learning a lot of these things. And so what would be like your top three books that you have written for people who need to just get like a better baseline understanding of everything before they can have that conversation with their kids or their teenagers or whatever? Okay. All right. My very first book I ever wrote was called Hot Sex, How to Do It. It's 20 years old. It's a bit, listen, you're going to have to close your eyes with some of the bits because it's not very woke because of 
how much things have changed, but it does cover all of the basics. But but I'm trying to think of another good sex book that's more, um, I'd definitely say No Shame for People with Kids. Mm -hmm. um, the book that I've just written is for over 50s, but that's not your demographic. I'm trying to go, because um, I'm sort of, yeah, I don't know. I should have to come well, back to you. Listen to your podcast. Or, or just yeah. your podcast where you're yeah, having conversations like this podcast. that are so helpful. I do. And there's lots of practical stuff in there. And my website has tons and tons of information as well. Um, I think I'm going to, the minute you get off, I'm going to think of a really good general sex book. Um, but yeah, my podcast has loads of information. My website, which is tracycox.com, T-R-A-C-E-Y-C-O-X.com. Um, and the podcast, by the way, is called Sex Talk. So it's T-O-K, not Sex Talk. Yes. Some people call it Sex Talk. So, um, but the, there is information out there. I mean, um, there are some pretty good websites out there. Anything that Kinsey has anything to do with is always, always very good. Justin Lee Miller, he does his po uh, podcast and a blog called Sex and Psychology. Mm. That's very good. Um, but yeah, my, probably my website has the basics. And the thing is, lots of people don't know the basics because you, you think, you, you think you're born knowing it. Like, and no one ever really sits down. I mean, have you two ever sat down and said, oh, how do you actually give a man oral sex? What do you do? <laughs> do you do it's so yeah. weird. <laughs> No yeah. one does that. You know but what? All through Cosmo, like... when we yeah, were growing up, we were reading Cosmo. Well, I used to be editor of Cosmo in Australia. Oh my gosh. So I was deputy editor, then associate editor. So that was my very early training. And the reason why I left Cosmo and wrote my first book was that I did a practical guide on masturbation, which was all about put your finger there, move it through to like uh -huh. do it, use loop while you're doing that, do this, like very practical information. And no one else was doing it. And every Cosmo bought the story, every Cosmo ran with it. And so, and then I got approached to a book deal, like, can we have more of this? And I said, fine. And that's my thing is practical stuff, covering the basics so that when you're talking to your kids and you, you know, or your boyfriend or your girlfriend, you know what you're talking about and can explain it. Because if you don't know how your body works, how do you explain it? If you don't know how to make yourself orgasm, how's your poor partner supposed to find out? Yeah, right. yeah. Right. Well, Tracy, it's been, <laughs> it's been so incredible talking to you. You have such great energy. And I feel like, like I said earlier, you really are doing the work to breaking these cycles and educating females, men, and anybody on the spectrum about their bodies. And um, I just applaud you. And this has been so fun. I, this was so fun I know, for us. Have you back. We have to have you back. <laughs> We have to have oh, you back be again yeah, because you, you're so incredible. Um, and we're going to link to all of your uh, websites, your podcast, your books in our show notes so people can connect with you more. And right. thank you so much. Well, I've thoroughly enjoyed it as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, have, a great, have a great evening for you. It's the, it's the evening. Yeah, it is. It's, um, so it's 5.38 or something like that. So that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we're just getting going over here so yeah, i know I but know. now I'm, I'm very awake now i'm like i'm awake <laughs> i know i'm very energized <laughs> all right all right, all right. Well, i'll see you both again yes, yes. Thank, thank you tracy you. okay thank you bye